Hello, everyone. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. Um, well, welcome to our lunch plenary session. We have a great lineup of plenary speakers for you today, starting with Sarah Parker Polly with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Then Governor Jared Polis will be joining us. And then finally, we have Mark Sturm with Katmai National Park, who will be joining us this evening. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Becky Nemec, and I am currently an assistant professor um, in the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department. Um, I'm one of the co-hosts for the conference, so we really appreciate you all being here. Um, and I'm also the director of the new Animal Human Policy Center here at Colorado State University. Um, and this center is really meant to be a resource for policymakers, government agencies to help them solve and avoid problems related to interactions between animals and people. Um, so if any of you have any questions about the center at any point, I know it relates to a lot of the work that you all do. Um, I'd love to chat with you. So now I'd like to introduce our first plenary speaker of the day. Um, I would also just like to briefly point out um, the index cards that you have on your tables. Nope, you do not have index cards. Just kidding. Oh, just making sure you're paying attention. Okay, so let's go straight into our um, our, our introduction. So Sarah Parker Polly um, has served as the director of the Missouri Department of Conservation since 2016. Previously, she has worked as a project manager for DJ um, Case and Associates, a natural resources communications firm, and as a deputy director for the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. She has been an instructor at the University of Missouri's School of Natural Resources, teaching a course in natural resource policy and administration. Please join us in welcoming Sarah Parker Polly for her talk titled The Value The Values War and Conservation. Changes coming. Are we ready? And the clicker. Oh, it's right here. Right here. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's had opportunity to have lunch that you are nourished. And so Becky, this is gonna be interesting. I know when my governor walks in, we all rise. So if the governor of Colorado walks in, I will assume you all are not just leaving in the middle of my talk, right? That maybe you're just showing respect. Um, it is fantastic to be here in Fort Collins. I think I left, uh, I know I left hot temperatures and mid-Missouri and high humidity. And so it's just uh, such a pleasure to join you all. And so grateful just for the invitation, but really more grateful just as I've spent time in the presentations and, and observing the conversations going on, just to be part of this amazing collaboration this week. So really appreciate those who have put on this conference. So a bit more of a, a self-introduction. According to my team, and I think I've got a couple of team members here somewhere um, in the audience. Hi, there you guys are. Good to see you. Um, so they can validate this. Uh, Michelle and Ellie will have to say, hmm. But according to some, some might say, hey, I just, that's just Sarah. Uh, some sometimes call me the director. Some might describe me as a lover of the outdoors, which is true. Some will say I'm an obsessed turkey hunter, which is also true. Some would say I'm an attorney by trade, not a biologist. To others, I've heard second and third hand that I have been described by members of my team as a Toyota driving woman whose dogs spend more time indoors being pets than hunting anything. And that last description is likely not intended to be positive by those that hold that view. And the truth is really that I'm all of those things. Uh, some of you would call me in that sense a pluralist, and I'm going to see if I can get this to work. I would thank you so much. See if that, if you can get it to move along. Uh, so I've got a short little video clip that I sure hope it works for you. Um, and I wanna show it to you because the reality is more and more of my MDC team are also, thank you so much. And Joe, just do, let's see, try it. <laughs> there, there. Oh. How? What if I just say next? And <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about this clip. 
assuming that it works. I've got short, just a short little clip and I show it to you just to suggest that more and more of my MDC team, and I have about 1800 members of the MDC team in Missouri, more and more are becoming pluralists and uh, mutualists. And we recently finished a round of regional meetings once a year, sometimes twice a year, but at least once a year, go around to all of the different regions and um, we'll meet with the staff in the field. So one of the presentations this time was of our law enforcement, they have new body cameras. And so they were demonstrating through various videos, the benefits to body cameras when they're out in the field doing just typical stops. This was one of the clips and it's just a small portion of one of the clips, but it's our agents having a conversation with kind of two notorious Ozark uh, family members who are notorious for never complying with the wildlife code in Missouri. And let's see if it works. What we noted is depending on where we were in the field. We're all drowning this ankle. Yeah. We got different uh, reactions where did, where did they when they put their dogs got, got out in that. the back of their yeah. trucks. Now these guys, it's That's it's illegal in Missouri. I don't know to hunt with dogs. Put them all in there if you don't want to when they came yeah. across them, all these dogs started pouring out from the woods. So our agents have asked them just to put the dogs back in the back in the truck. Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you get the other one going out there? Oh, yeah. They'll be back in a little bit. Here comes Brown. So it's so entertaining because they said, no, we're not hunting with dogs. And pretty soon, I mean, it was one after the other. There was like six dogs at the end that all came in at the end. But it was just that minor little thing at the end that we didn't think anything about until we got out to different uh, parts of the state. And in the more urban parts of the state, as they kind of flung the hunting dogs in the back of the truck, we heard these gasps from some of our staff because they didn't like the way that the dogs were treated. And so to me, that just uh, illust a small little illustration, but really what we're talking about this week, which is changing values related to wildlife, but animals in general. I, I swear I'm not gonna get this. I really do need you to, <laughs> what am I doing wrong now? Oh, there we go, there we go, woohoo. So no surprise to anyone here, change is all around us. It's everywhere. And you've heard it from nearly all the speakers. And as, as author Heather McGowan noted, she said, today is the slowest rate of change that you will experience for the rest of your lives. Think about that for a minute. A bit overwhelming. And it's overwhelming to me as a stake director thinking about that just from a natural resource perspective, the impacts of climate change and loss of species and biodiversity and shrinking habitat, increase in wildlife disease and on and on. And then add to that the impacts of changes in society. And it, it just, in all honesty, it does become a bit overwhelming and especially using technology that apparently I'm incapable of using. Here we go, cross the nation. Um, so are state conservation agencies ready to respond to the current rate of change in all of these areas? And I tend to be an optimist most days. And yet I will say it is a bit overwhelming because many of our state agencies are constrained by outdated missions, models of governance, you heard that a bit yesterday, funding structures, capacity skill sets, sometimes mindsets, by legal and political constraints, by competing priorities and on and on. And yet, the mission of our natural resource agencies to ensure healthy and abundant fish, wildlife, air, land, and water has never been more important than it is today. Our very well-being, our very well-being as the human race depends on it. So failure is simply not an option. But the mission of natural resource agencies, I believe, also includes sustaining the public will and their support and connecting the people to those resources. It's this second part of our mission that so much of the conversation this week is focused on. 
So what are we doing in Missouri? Let's start with a just a brief history. And actually, Jeff, as you talked a little bit about the Colorado history, it's like so many uh, other states represented here today. So quickly in Missouri, by the 1860s, insatiable demand for fur and feathers had pretty much emptied our forests. By the late 1800s in Missouri, the largest lumber mill in the world came to the Ozarks to feed the booming railroad industry's thirst for railroad ties and a growing nation's need for wood products. In 1912 alone, 15 million hand-hewn railroad ties were sold in Missouri. So as you can imagine, by turn of the last century, our forests and wildlife, even our waterways were depleted and in very bad shape. But that's not the end of our story. What came next was the beginning of what is defined as the Missouri model of conservation. And it is this, first of all, Citizens wanted their Forest, Fish, and Wildlife Agency to be separate from the political influence of the day. They wanted Forest, Fish, and Wildlife decisions to be science-based. And they accomplished this through constitutional amendment and the creation of a conservation commission, no more than two from any political party, appointed by the governor, with the authority to set regulations, to set budget priorities, and more. And grassroots efforts to get us to this point in the 1930s were led, yes, by sportsmen, but also by members of garden clubs in Kansas City and St. Louis, by service organizations, by a diversity of Missourians, and it passed by a strong margin. So the next piece of the model. So first is this independent constitutional authority. The next piece of the model is adequate funding. Citizens came back in the 1970s to provide dedicated conservation funding. So one eighth of one cent sales tax in Missouri goes to our agency to accomplish our mission. This funding, this broad-based funding has allowed us to think more broadly as to whom we serve. 62% of our funding today comes from the sales tax, much of this from the urban areas. So it has been a good framework for more than four decades to consider not only traditional hunters and anglers, but to all of those that contribute to the funding model. And by the way, Missourians a decade later passed another one-tenth of one sales tax for parks, soils, and water. And finally, the third piece of the Missouri model is characterized by continued and robust engagement with our public. In essence, ensuring that we are sustaining this public will and support. It's actually part of our mission to protect and manage the fish, forest, and wildlife resources of the state and to facilitate and provide opportunity for all citizens to use, enjoy, and learn about these resources. The very first social scientist for a state fish and wildlife agency, Missouri Department of Conservation, mid-1970s. And today, we've got two here, a unit of fantastic social scientists who deploy a variety of methods to connect and engage the public, to solicit input, and to build consensus. But like all elsewhere, change is happening in Missouri too. Nothing like Nevada and what Tony mentioned yesterday, but still change. So America's Wildlife Values Report suggests an estimated 35% of the public nationally are mutualists. This drops to 25% of Missourians and only 2.5% of MDC staff. 28% of those surveyed nationally considered themselves traditionalists, about 37% of Missourians, but a whopping 75% of MDC staff surveyed consider themselves traditionalists. So you see uh, where we are. And so how do we navigate and implement the mission in times of change, particularly in dealing with changes in society versus our own internal makeup? Many of you know the researcher and author, Thomas Friedman. He says, the more people are anchored in communities where they feel connected, protected, and respected, then the more people are ready to reach out and experiment in times of change. Otherwise, they want to build walls to protect themselves from change. So I would use slightly different words than Thomas. I would say where people feel they are listened to and engaged, where they feel there is strong two-way communication and open dialogue, and where they feel there is ongoing relationship and connection, they are more willing to trust and support their agency. 
So I'm going to give you two brief examples in Missouri about how we have been working on methods to engage our citizenry. The first example is about urban deer. And I'm going to talk about a suburb of St. Louis called Town and Country, very affluent suburb known for good schools, many retirees, large homes with lots of green space and a very act active municipal government. So early 1990s, deer densities had reached to the point where residents were complaining a lot to their municipal leaders and they wanted something done, but no agreement as to what should be done. Finally, around 1999 to 2000, about 233 deer were trapped and relocated to state properties that allowed deer hunting. Then chronic wasting disease hit the national stage. So our conservation commission made the decision to no longer allow deer to be relocated. But unfortunately, we didn't tell the community why we had made that change. And that led to some distress, which I'll mention again later. 2003 to 2005, the town is, city of town and country participates in a regional task force that we set up with representatives from other municipalities and three government agencies to, to identify best options forward. Still, there wasn't complete trust, so they set up their own task force comprised just of aldermen and uh, brought in experts to do their own testimony and develop their own recommendations. One of their recommendations was to do surgical sterilization of female deer and some sharpshooting. And even though MDC wasn't strongly supportive of surgical sterilization as a long-term solution, we supported them in their efforts. It was an opportunity for us to compromise, to say, okay, let's try it. We're willing to work with you and help build that relationship and trust. January 12, a couple of years later, they quit the sterilization efforts in favor of investing more time in sharpshooting. So this has the, been the methodology and the development of trying different strategies and working together. By January of 2020, deer vehicle collision numbers reduced to half of the 2010 numbers, but it took us nearly two decades to get there. And in fact, in 2020, they also finally supported um, an archery only deer season for the first time ever. With these efforts in place, population density does remain stable to this day. So lessons learned just in this case of a two decade long relationship with this community, be open and honest in building the relationship of trust. I mentioned earlier that we halted relocation efforts over concerns about CWD. However, we didn't tell the community leaders or the public why. And as a result, there existed a palatable, <laughs> palatable level of mistrust between the department and the city. It was common, in fact, for our staff to be questioned about the real motivations of the department to not allow relocation. The implication was that we were pushing the city to allow archery hunting in order to sell more permits. And that mistrust lingered for several years, but finally and slowly dissipated due to more regular communication between the city and the department. Again, the value of communication through the regional task force, having a single point of contact that they could call any time to ask questions. We encourage them even to publish updated information on a regular basis about their deer management efforts and the current population densities. So there was good benefit in this collaboration, the strong communication. You cannot, cannot over communicate. And then just the, the this fact of being collaborative and compromising as it related to supporting sterilization to support the community. They came to the sense that it wasn't the best method, but it was as a result of us all working together. I wanna to mention one other important element to this story, and that's the importance of identifying similarly held or shared values. The example here is the donation of deer meat to Operation Food Search which is the regional food bank hub in St. Louis. In fact, since the deer management efforts began in town and country, over 68,000 pounds of meat have been donated to those in need. And from our wildlife biologist in that area, she said, when the community realized that deer harvest truly is just that, it's harvest, she said, I believe that led to greater support for deer management in town and country. But our work is never done because change never stops. And I'll just one little uh, final note here. The city administrator recently reported that just in the last year, they're facing a new and interesting barrier in that 
residents, newer, younger residents are moving to the community who have not had the experience uh, with overpopulation of deer and are asking many questions about why is the community so focused on deer management? So the point is, uh, as always, our work continues to collaborate, communicate, to build relationship and trust. Another quick story I wanna share is about black bears in Missouri. So how have we applied even the lessons learned on open uh, dialogue? Missouri does have a uh, growing and expanding black bear population and in many parts of the state, a public that is largely very unfamiliar with bears. In 2020, MDC went through a complete review and update of our black bear management plan, which involved lots of partner and public engagement efforts. We held four open houses that were held in order to gather input on the draft plan and then on other aspects of black bear management plan, including the possibility of a future hunting season. Three of the open houses were held in uh, close to or in primary bear range, one was held in St. Louis to ensure that a broader of, of, array of input was received. The St. Louis open house had over 400 attendees and reached capacity at the auditorium where it was held. So we do have a very interested and active public. MDC's approach to black bear management we know is very similar to many other states and is certainly multifaceted. Additionally, MDC also conducted a large scale human dimension study to gain an understanding of the public's perceptions and attitudes toward black bears and black bear management. So Missouri is home to around 6 million people, about 60, close to 70% live in or near our urban communities of St. Louis, Kansas City, also Springfield. Whereas the majority of bear range encompasses some of the most rural parts of the state. So to ensure we could understand the attitudes and perceptions of those that reside in both urban areas and in rural areas where the bears generally reside, we used a stratified sampling design which will allow us to better address social caring capacity within areas actually occupied by bears, also areas on the periphery of bear range, and then areas where bears do not yet occur. And we'll continue to use this research coupled with black bear population research to establish population benchmarks by which hunting will be a primary tool to manage bears relative to those benchmarks. MDC successfully implemented its first black bear season in 2021 without any well, lawsuits, I might add, which is more uncommon than common across the country. These initial seasons are truly designed to provide opportunity for Missourians interested in the sustainable harvest of this valued natural resource. But we took an incredibly methodical approach to developing a season framework proposal, which included thoughtful considerations on season timing and methods, in essence, no bait or dogs, on season length, and even included the establishment of a harvest quota and then robust safeguards to validate the harvest and provide season closure options. We also required the retrieval of meat and prohibited the sale of bear parts, including explicit prohibitions on bear gallbladders. Given the significance of these proposed regulations, MDC went through an initial public input process, which was used to refine the proposed season framework. Due to the pandemic, this initial public input phase was done all online with a pre-recorded presentation and online questionnaire. We received over 4,000 comments during this initial input process. So once the season framework was finalized and approved by our commission, we established permit and harvest quotas for each of three bear management zones. And we took a very conservative approach again to harvest and set quotas at levels that would allow for continued population growth, even if all of the quotas were reached. As part of this process, we even had proactive discussions with representatives from the Missouri Humane Society, to discuss how we established the quotas and all of the safeguards that were put into place to ensure a sustainable harvest. And while these discussions perhaps were challenging at times, and there were some fundamental disagreements on the harvest 
It did allow for discussions on common goals, such as public education regarding black bears. So this conversation, in fact, led to a joint bear aware webinar for our Missouri Humane Society members. So again, I might add to date, no lawsuits around the black bear season. Uh, I give all the credit to our social science team for just all of the methodologies and protocols put in place to ensure strong communication, listening to feedback, and just continuing with an existing trusting relationship with the department and the public. So despite many constraints, barriers, challenges, state, are state agencies ready for change? Well, I would say, yes, they are but we're all in various stages of pivoting or adapting to address change, including changing attitudes towards wildlife. Progress is happening at the state level. It's also, I believe, happening at the national level as well. And here are just a few examples of, it, not at all an exhaustive list, but some of the things that are happening at the national level. The Blue Ribbon Panel, which of course Tony had been so involved in uh, dating back to 2015, the purpose of that was to examine ways to increase funding for state and tribal wildlife agencies and to develop a roadmap that agencies can use to overcome barriers to broader relevance, public engagement, and support. And of, course, and of course, that Blue Ribbon Panel led to Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which is still making its way through Congress and hopefully will be successful this congressional cycle. It certainly led to the relevancy roadmap that each state fish and wildlife agency is now adapting for its own purpose. It led to increasing social science capacity, both at the national level and additional uh, regional focus as well through our regional associations. It's led to some very interesting One Health discussions. In fact, last September at the annual meeting of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, we adopted a resolution supporting state, provincial, territorial, and association leadership for a One Health approach to the well being of people and wildlife, and followed up with a presidential task force uh, to further develop those recommendations. So there's many discussions at AFWA related meetings also on the ripeness of reframing or updating our conservation model construct to address changing values related to wildlife and nature and to ensure conservation's relevance into the future. And Tony mentioned, I believe that yesterday as well. So what about in Missouri? I wanna hit just a few things that we are trying to do to really face and embrace change as well. Number one, and pretty significantly, we reorganized as an agency about three years ago, and perhaps the, the biggest reorganization that's occurred in its uh, more than 80 year history. Uh, part of the reorganization, we had over a 10 month period, an interdisciplinary team designed to really uh, design a 21st century conservation agency and aspects included restructuring uh, to really be a systems uh, focused organization versus a discipline focus. We developed and finally approved a comprehensive conservation strategy where we prioritized geographies and habitats with a focus on uh, habitats and suites of species. We created a relevancy branch to focus efforts on engaging new and underserved audiences. Um, we re-energized our private lands and community conservation branch uh, with 93% of our lands and private ownership. We've had a branch now for over two decades, very focused on engaging private landowners, but now with an increased focus on engaging with new communities, especially those communities that have not been served in the past. Continuing to support a social science work, we have a, a, a new group that's working on a One Health collaborative, including engaging other state agencies in Missouri, our Department of Health uh, and Senior Service, our Department of Agriculture, our Environmental Agency, and on and on. We meet with them on a quarterly basis. We also, we think, probably have the first interagency One Health lab that is in process now of being constructed in the state of Missouri. We focus a lot on partners and annual meeting of our partners round table, over a thousand people are invited to that round table in which we engage and talk about um, things to come and shared priorities. And that list, that list of a thousand is not your ordinary list. It in, involves a lot of perhaps atypical conservation partners, including volunteer fire departments, agricultural partners, academic institutions, and more. We also have something called the Conservation Monitor, which on a quarterly basis 
We have an outside consultant that engages with a panel of uh, randomly selected Missourians to ask key questions on their level of trust with the agency, uh, how confident they are that we're using their funds wisely, and other key questions uh, just to assess their support and engagement with the department. So in times of historic, dizzying, divisive change, what else is needed to ensure that we work to build relationship with the public and their respective wildlife values? I love this quote by my deputy director, Jason Sumners. He says, it's one thing to invite everyone to the table, but if we don't know how to move through those conversations or there's no compromise or collaboration on either side, this really is challenging. So I'd say what else is needed? I would say humility as agencies and as individuals. We don't always have the answers and we shouldn't suggest that we do. We have to ask ourselves, are we the barrier or are we one of the barriers? We need to embrace the diversity of perspectives and not fear them. We need to work to develop a more current model of wildlife conservation. And more than anything, agencies need to embrace and not fear change. And we need you to do that. As our social scientists, we need you to help us navigate through these changing and certain times. We need you to help us understand there is no us and them, there's just us. So I start where we began our journey in order to emphasize that I believe we need our social scientists to help us with the second part of this mission, to sustain the public's will and its support of the agency and to connect our public to the resources we're working to manage and protect. We need you to help us with change to ensure that we're changing fast enough and effectively enough to ensure we continue our ever critical work. Because again, there's not an us and them, there's really just us. If you guys saw 60 Minutes last week, the, the record mogul and, and tycoon Rick Rubin, uh, who's he's a bit legendary, but he talks a lot about art. And here was a quote about art, but I think it, it really relates to good govern, governance, good government and good communication. He says, you're never alone when you're making art. You're in a constant dialogue with what is and what was. And the closer you can tune into that discussion, the better you can serve the work before you. I believe we have an obligation to tune in to the discussion, not run from it our shared work is too important. Thank you. <laughs> See, you all could have just stood up. I would have thought it was for me, but in fact, it really is for the governor of Colorado. <laughs> There's probably no time for you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for that talk um, on conflicting values and conservation. It's really, really inspiring to see all the work that you and your agency have done, um, integrating social science, responding to diverse values, thinking about novel ways of governance. And so, um, yeah, we really appreciate your talk today. All right. So um, I am honored to welcome our new, our next guest, um, Governor Jared Polis. Um, Governor Jared Polis is an entrepreneur, education leader, public servant, and Colorado native. After launching several successful companies, including one out of his college dorm room, Polis committed himself to making sure other Coloradans had the opportunity to pursue their dreams. Polis founded schools for at-risk students and new immigrants and started nonprofits to help veterans and entrepreneurs. Prior to serving as governor, Polis served on the State Board of Education, where he worked to raise pay for teachers and reduce class for students, and represented Colorado's second congressional district, where he was rated the most effective member of the Colorado delegation. As governor, Polis has focused on saving Coloradans money, keeping our economy strong, and preserving our Colorado way of life. Polis delivered universal free full-day kindergarten, signed a number of bills to save families money on health care, 
and made significant progress towards the goal of 100% renewable energy by 2040, all while cutting taxes for small businesses and investing in affordable housing and transportation. His efforts to expand healthcare access to medically underserved communities and to ensure that equity and justice remain central to building a Colorado for all have produced impactful legislation and made progress towards his administration's bold visions. So please join us in welcoming Governor Jared Polis for his talk titled A Vision of Wildlife Management in Colorado. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nemec. I also want to thank Dr. Manfredo, conference organizer. I understand you were joined by some great folks from our state, uh, Jeff Davis yesterday, and it's Dr. Kate Karen Bailey here. She, I think she was here yesterday as well. I'm not sure if she's still here. Hi, there she is, Dr. Bailey. Thanks for joining us at this other institution up north. Um, and uh, we're very excited to uh, be part of this um, with some of our thinkers and doers in the wildlife and, and mutualism realm. You know, it's really at the very heart of our identity as Coloradans that this is a beautiful place with uh, crazy, amazing outdoor spaces. And of course, uh, the plants and animals that inhabit that are a big part of what makes life special. Uh, it's iconic. It's uh, people from around the world travel here to experience the wild Colorado way firsthand, which uh, is a big part of our economy with the tourism sector leading the way. Um, I know that many of you have conducted research um, that helps show that the way that we're thinking about and relating to animals and ecosystems is shifting. And that's a good thing. And Colorado is always a forward looking place. We want to lean into that. We know that we're also home to a very diverse set of values and viewpoints about animals and stewardship. And that creates, of course, challenges, but also opportunities for wildlife agencies to really more deeply consider the, to deeply consider the new uh, and innovative and humane ways that we can manage wildlife in the future. This conference is an important opportunity to work towards those solutions to the questions we face about managing wildlife, considering the broad suite of perspectives on wild animals uh, among Coloradans. During my time as governor, we worked to take a thoughtful data-driven approach to protecting Colorado's wildlife and animals, in a way that makes sense for the animals and for the people alike, just to see how sometimes the expectations and thoughts of people change. Um, many of you know, I've been a Boulder resident most of my life. Um, you go up the canyon uh, town, Netherland, many of you might be familiar with it. And there's always been, of course, part of why people want to live, there's always been uh, mountain lions in and around Netherland. It's very much, you know, out in, in the uh, wilderness area. And the last few years, we're hearing, you know, more reports about people's dogs being attacked and that sort of thing. So, but the difference isn't really that the mountain lions are there more. The difference is that people who live in Netherland now have chihuahuas and that never happened 20 years ago. So it's just a it's just a changing way of life, and that's leading to changing expectations. Um, during my first year in office, I signed an executive order that focused a interdepartmental efforts on wildlife crossings that uh, uh, can help connect habitat and also reduce vehicle collisions. Uh, we had about four thousand vehicle crashes involving big game in Colorado, leading to eighty million dollars in. Uh, property damage, loss of human life, uh, human injuries, wildlife, loss of life and injury. And uh, we're very excited to really center the work we're doing around investing in successful wildlife crossings. I visited one recently on US 160 near Pagosa Springs, uh, and more than 60% of the crashes in that stretch of highway are because of wildlife vehicle collisions. And based on the data uh, that we're seeing, the new crossing is reducing these uh, wildlife uh, vehicle incidences by over 80%. And so there's great promise to reduce traffic, uh, of course, reduce um, crashes that can injure or kill people and animals, and uh, to be able to connect habitat uh, with these projects. And that's a big win for animals and for people and for our ecosystems. We're also really being proactive about navigating and reducing human bear interactions as our communities grow. Uh, more Coloradans are living in areas that bears have traditionally lived in search for food. We started a new grant program at Colorado Parks and Wildlife that 
uh, to limit the negative interactions that can harm bears and humans and property. It's called the Human Bear Conflict Reduction Grant Program. And we basically got money out for things like bear resistant garbage containers, electric fencing, um, cameras, supporting nonprofits that glean uh, excess fruit from trees that might attract bears, education for homeowners in areas that might be subject to it. So these are all locally driven strategies. We didn't, we just funded them. We really welcome nonprofits and communities from across the state to come up with their ideas and put them before us. And that helps save money for Coloradans, less damage to cars and to homes and to trash cans, uh, less cost for CPW of having to relocate bears and money saved by local governments that themselves would otherwise have to respond to these incidences. So that's another example of a win-win that we hope to expand on to reduce uh, bear human interactions as well. Um, those are just a few examples of the great work that is happening in our state and that we're fast becoming here uh, at CSU and with Dr. Nemitz's new work uh, and, and many others, the epicenter for uh, a lot of meaningful research about how uh, people and animals can better uh, coexist. Earlier this year, I joined the opening of the DU Institute for Animal Sentience and Protection. Uh, we're excited to welcome that at our, our largest private university, DU. And of course, CSU's very own Animal Human Policy Center that Dr. Nemec and Dr. Manfredo are working on. Uh, Dr. Bailey does uh, similar work drawing from her global experience at CU. Uh, these issues are, I'm sure it doesn't come as any surprise of, to us. They're not unique to Colorado. Um, there's longstanding issues of how economies can function and people can function, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Asia, whether it's here. Uh, I think the, the mindset is that we believe that this great wildlife diversity should be part of a strength, part of our quality of life, part of our uh, economic value that we offer to tourists and for outdoor recreation, uh, rather than seen as an extractive industry uh, or as a threat. And we're in the forefront of this change in so many ways. And we're so excited to work with the center to develop solutions like wildlife crossings, like reducing bear interactions. These are examples, wins for animals, wins for people. Uh, and saving money. And I know the center can be a resource for policymakers and government agencies in every other state and indeed across the world to solve problems and even better avoid problems that are related to our interactions with animals. We're really at the forefront in Colorado of this incredible change with your thoughtful, deliberative work yesterday, today, a lot of the convening and the work to come. And I'm so proud that we can and will continue to build on expanding this important conversation and translating the conversation into real action uh, that can improve public safety, improve our quality of life, and better protect our ecosystems and our animals in the state of Colorado. Uh, my goal as governor would be able for our work here to be a model for the rest of the nation and the world uh, and something that will benefit Coloradans for many generations. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge um, Jeff Davis. Uh, is he still with us or he was with you yesterday? There you are. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Uh, recently moved here from Washington State and he brought the rain with him, didn't he? Um, it's usually dry here, Jeff. This is very unusual. Um, Jeff started May 1st as our Colorado Parks and Wildlife Director. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge and experience. You heard from Jeff yesterday. Uh, he's really going to be a critical piece of uh, this exciting vision of uh, really evolving sort of the status quo way that things have been done, uh, which works for what it works for. And, um, you know, we all, you know, hearken back to conservationists like Teddy Roosevelt and others, but uh, there's often times when you need to update and, and, and build the 2.0 version of how you're going to uh, successfully manage wildlife. And uh, uh, sometimes existing and legacy models are good for what they're good for, but it's really important to think out of the box, to think about the future, uh, to work with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Board, to work with the increasingly diverse users of uh, outdoor recreation and kind of where our state is today and where we expect to be tomorrow uh, with all of the uh, great ways that we enjoy being in and around our outdoor areas, both through our state parks, as well as wildlife on federal lands and other lands. Um, I know that we're excited to welcome Jeff. I know that you are too. Hopefully he's establishing some good connections with many of you. A lot of you are doing important work that can inform uh, the deliberations about how Colorado can really lead the way um, with this vision 
uh, of being able to make improvements in both physical, uh, behavioral aspects that benefit humans, benefit wildlife, make our state safer, make our state more enjoyable and more prosperous. Uh, we're really looking to um, you know, check all those boxes. So hopefully um, that's what we can do uh, and find how we can move forward together to make sure that we make Colorado an even more amazing place for the future. So thank you for all of your great work. All right. Oh, I think you just took my notes away. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Governor Polis, so much um, for being here today. <laughs> I um, We really appreciate it. We know how much of a busy schedule you have. And so um, we just greatly appreciate you sharing our vision, um, your vision for, for wildlife management in Colorado and incorporating diverse voices moving forward. And it's so exciting to hear about those wins, um, both for people and for animals. All right, so our um, that concludes our lunchtime plenary session for today. We do have another plenary speaker um, uh, who's going to be talking this evening, and that's Mark Sturm with Katmai National Park. I'm going to be talking about wildlife viewing and how to integrate that into wildlife management, specific, specifically bear viewing. So I'm sure if you want to see some great bear photos, I'm not going to promise anything, but I'm sure there will be some in that presentation. Um, that will start at 6 p.m. and there will be a, a dinner available for everyone as well. So thank you so much um, for coming and have a great afternoon.